All right, I've received this question now a couple of times, and I just, I, you know, I haven't gotten around to it because there's a lot of other things uh, to get done. What about the supposed contradiction between Second Chronicles chapter 22 verse 2 and Second Kings chapter 8 verse 26? Chronicles says that Ahaziah was 40 and two years old when he began to reign. Um, uh, Kings, the one in Second Kings, says that Ahaziah was 20, two and 20 years old. So they say, well, which one is it? Is he 42 or 22? That's a contradiction. Um, well, you know, let me just explain something here. Um, this is a book here uh, from Peter Ruckman, a really, really good book on the supposed errors. And I bought this thing many, many years ago uh, when I was originally studying um, for the ministry way back quite some time ago, <laughs> probably almost 20 years ago now. But this one probably about 15 years ago. But, um, and I, I thought to myself, you know, when I read the supposed contradictions, I thought, okay, I'll look and see what these two passages are. I'll just look at the verses, and I'm going to put the book down, and I'm going to pick up my King James Bible, and I'm going to look at these two passages, and I'm going to try to see if I can pick where they supposedly contradict. Most of the time, I couldn't. Most of the time, it was like I had to look and say, okay, what's the supposed contradiction? I don't get it. And he'd say it, and I'd be like, oh, I, okay, I guess, yeah, I guess it's there, <laughs> you know. Uh, I approach the Bible as a believer, not as a skeptic, as a critic. Um, you can cut the Bible all up, make it say all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's, that's the ones that come out with a question on this whole thing. And they pose it to Bible believers, and the Bible believer goes, okay, I don't know how to answer that. It looks like a real contradiction. Okay, Now, the way I would look at it, just what my original thought was, just to tell you, I look at it and I say, okay, um, Ahaziah was 42 years old, Ahaziah was 22 years old uh, when he began to reign. Well, I would look and I would say, okay, um, you could have certain levels of ruling that would come in when you're 22, and then you would say maybe take over another kingdom or whatever else, and you would start to reign there when you're 42. In other words, there was 20 years of span between the two. I'll give you an example, King James. King James was the king of Scotland before he was king of England. See? He was actually named King of Scotland, I think, when he was just a little boy. But he wasn't named King of England until many years later. See? So you could say King James, King James was made king when he was, we'll say, six years old, and then made king when he was 30 years old or something, we'll say. All right? You say, well, that's a contradiction. No, it's just two different systems there. So I would look at that thing and I'd go, what's the big deal? You know? I mean, you could have two different guys that had different accounts or what I, you know, I look at that and I go, and that's a reason to throw out the Bible, you know, but Bible believing Christians get this little attack. And so I'm going to read here, uh, what Ruckman has to say about this. Um, I usually try to do my own study and blah, 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 but you know, I'm not the end all solution. Okay. I need to get that through to people. Um, and I, you know, I'm not upset at anybody that sent me the question. Of course not. You certainly can ask me things, but I'm going to point you to some good sources once in a while and say, um, other people have done the work, you know, uh, preachers don't need to reinvent the wheel when they go into ministry. Okay. You can say, Hey, you can listen, you can look at Ruckman's stuff here on the Bible contradictions. You can see some of the stuff in his commentaries there. Um, you can get some good sermon ideas from some of these guys down in here, Lester Roloff and Charles Spurgeon and, you know, J. Frank Norris and some of these old heroes of the faith. You can look over here and you can see the stuff by Jeff Godwin on rock music and you can you understand what I'm saying okay I don't have to study all these different subjects me, from me and my personal I, I can say hey look at brother so-and-so look at brother so-and-so over here you know for you ladies over this way this this book here and that book there you understand so we'll read here uh, it says here this is the classic boo-boo of the King James Bible which is also shared by the official Masoretic Old Testament text of Orthodox Judaism. All attempts to lay the devilment at the feet of the AV translators is useless, for they translated exactly the official received text of every Orthodox Jew from Moses to David Ben-Gurion. Okay, in other words, they can't say, well, this was a false translation there. That's why one should have, it was a copyist error, or some 42, and they, they shouldn't have said 42. It should have been 22 in both cases, or vice versa. No. That's the way it is in the Hebrew text, in other words. 
so there isn't a contradiction in just the English, you know, a supposed contradiction. It would be there in the Hebrew as well. Now there is an easy way out of the problem, which we will mention but will not adopt. The easiest way out is to simply say that the 42 years of Second Chronicles is written with the word was in italics. So the 42 years is the Hebrew idiom for a son of 42 years. Note the outrageous mangling of the Hebrew idiom in 1 Samuel 13, 1 by the New Schofield Reference Bible and the grossly corrupt New American Standard hash brown potatoes. You know, <laughs> Ruckman's sense of humor. I didn't write, you know, I didn't say that. I mean, that's what's written there. This would mean that Ahaziah descended the throne the 42nd year of Omri's kingdom. Omri's kingdom, which included the house of Ahab, comes in during the 31st to 32nd uh, year of the reign of Asa, 1 Kings 16.23. It is exactly 42 years from that time to the 8th year of Jehoram, 2 Kings 8, verse 16, if Jehoshaphat and Jehoram are consecutive. If the text is taken in that fashion, then Ahaziah is the literal youngest son of Jehoram, and his other name is Jehoahaz, and another name is Azariah. 2 Chronicles 22, verse 1, 2 Chronicles 21, verse 17, and 2 Chronicles 22, verse 6. In such a case, his mother was the granddaughter of Omri, 2 Chronicles 21, verse 6, not the daughter of Omri, 2 Chronicles 22, verse 2. Now this is the easy way out. If push came to shove, any Bible believer could resort to the method above, and no one alive or dead could prove that there is a genuine contradiction in the text. However, there are some interesting addendas to the account that will complicate matters considerably. Observe, number one, Ahaziah is said to be the son of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 22, verse 9. And Jehoshaphat is said to be the king of Israel, 2 Chronicles 21, verse 2. This is a remarkable turn of events, for Jehoshaphat was king of Judah, not Israel. In addition to being a son of Jehoshaphat, second point here, in Jehoram, we read that Ahaziah was also the son-in-law to the house of Ahab, 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. Now, how does Ahaziah become a son-in-law to the house of Ahab when he married Zibiah of Beersheba, 2 Chronicles 24, verse 1? He didn't marry any of Ahab's daughters or Omri's daughters. Number three, point number three. In 1 Kings 22, verse 26, is one of the most remarkable statements in the Bible. It is a statement that the king's son named Joash is waiting back in Israel to take every one of the tribes of the dual kingdom, kingdom if Ahab or Jehoshaphat get killed. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 26, chapter, and verse 28 through 29, and 30, verse 34 and verse 37. The boy is only a three-year-old, excuse me, only a one-year-old, and he cannot ascend the throne until he is nearly eight. 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 1. In their mad haste to rid themselves forever of the hated King James text, the born-again fundamentalists and evangelicals, who believed in the verbal plenary inspiration of the 10 o'clock newscast, <laughs> forget to study the Bible. They were no more serious about their Bible studies than the members of the New Schofield Reference Bible or the Lockman Foundation. Ahaziah had given birth to Joash before he, Ahaziah, ever sat on the throne of Judah. You see, when Ahab was killed, a different Ahaziah took over the throne of Israel, 2 Kings chapter 1, not the Ahaziah whose mother was the daughter of Omri, and who said, who was said to be the son of Jehoshaphat, not of Ahab, 2 Chronicles 22, verse 9. Even his other name, Ahaziah, appears in the list of Jehoshaphat's sons, 2 Chronicles 21, verse 2. Obviously, then, the Ahaziah of our problem was not Jehoram's literal son, and obviously, or not so obviously, if you are looking for alibis to reject authority, he was intended to be put on the southern throne, Judah, many years before he finally got there. His mother was Athaliah, who was Omri's daughter, that is, she was Ahab's sister, 1 Kings 16, 29. If Ahaz, or excuse me, if Ahaziah was her son and Jehoshaphat was his father, then when Jehoshaphat joined affinity with Ahab, 2 Chronicles 18, verse 1, there was more involved than a military alliance. Jehoshaphat's title was King of Israel, 2 Chronicles 21, verse 2, signifying the ominous alliance. For Jehoram, his son is said to have killed, quote, divers also of the prince, princes of Israel. End quote. To all purposes, if Ahab got killed, one of Jehoshaphat's kin folks could take over Israel. Conversely, if Jehoshaphat died in battle, then one of Ahab's kin's folk, kin folk can take over Judah when Jehoram is uh, through. He does. Ahaziah, after the death of Jehoshaphat, is Ahab's nephew and a son-in-law to his household. Now, the only way he can be a son-in-law is by marrying one of Ahab's daughters or granddaughters. However, 
he must never, we must never forget that Jehoram was in Ahab's house. If Ahaziah married any of Jehoram's daughters, he would be son-in-law to the house of Ahab. Zibiah, 2 Chronicles 24, verse 1, is bound to have been one of Jehoram's daughters. Now this reconciles everything except the statement that Ahaziah was Jehoram's son. However, we can read through enough Bible to know that a son-in-law can be a son, Luke 3.23, 1 Samuel 24, 24, verse 16. We also learn that Ahaziah could not have been Jehoram's literal son, for he was older than his father when his father died. His father was 40 years old. There is even a third possibility open. Jehoram could have married Athaliah after she gave birth to Ahaziah. This would, have been, this would have made Ahaziah Jehoram's stepson. If both father Jehoshaphat and son Jehoram came in unto the same woman, Athaliah, the glaring omission of Ahaziah, Uzziah, and Azariah in Christ's genealogy is perfectly explainable. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. For this violates the law of Moses, Leviticus, Leviticus 18, verse 8. And this time it is a violation of the, in the Messianic line that leads to the throne of David. We have old Ahaziah spotted. He is not Jehoram's literal son. He is a stepson or a son-in-law at the most. He was Omri's pet because his mother was Omri's daughter, not granddaughter. Second Chronicles 22, verse 2. This means that he was 22 years old during the fifth year of the reign of Jehoshaphat, which would be the seventh to eighth year of the reign of Ahab, Omri's son. Omri undoubtedly aspires to put him on the throne of Judah. Ahab begins the last or the long string of diplomatic exchanges, summit, summit conferences, and Camp David Bull sessions. Sarcasm there, uh, if you can't tell. <laughs> uh, which are to bring this about. In Jehoshaphat's third year, 2 Chronicles 17, verse 7, he prospers and rises to a powerful position in Palestine, 2 Chronicles 17, verses 10 through 11. And for the fourth year, he joined affinity with Ahab, 2 Chronicles 18, verse 1. And it is at this point, the fifth to sixth year of Jehoshaphat and the eighth to ninth year of Ahab, that Ahaziah, Omri's grandson, is 22 years old. Since arrangements are made for him to succeed Jehoshaphat on the throne of Judah, he probably, like David, was anointed on the spot. Jehoshaphat is given the title of the king of Israel in case Ahab dies. As it works out, Ahab dies, and since Ahaziah, Omri's grandson, was cut out of the southern tribe, Judah, the inheritor of Israel, the northern tribes, is another Ahaziah, who begats another Jehoram, 2 Kings, 11, or 2 Kings 1, verse 17. When Jehoshaphat dies, Ahaziah is destined to take over the throne of, at Judah, which he does. Jehoram's reign then of eight years must be a joint reign with Jehoshaphat during the latter's military alliances with Ahaziah, Ahab's son, and his defunct shipbuilding operations, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 35 and verse 37. This means that Ahaziah, Ahab's son Israel, had a joint reign with Ahab beginning in Ahab's 17th to 18th year, and Jehoram, Ahab's, Ahab's grandson Israel, had a joint reign with Ahab the 19th year of Ahab's reign, three kings at one time, one sick, one in battle, and one on the throne. Ahaziah then is anointed to be the king of Judah at 22 years of age, but fails to sit down on the throne until he is 42. Okay, I mean, that makes sense to me. This tallies with all Hebrew, Greek, and English texts, unless they have altered the God-given text in order to add converts to the greatest cult in the world, the Alexandrian cult of educated shysters. One should never abandon the King James text simply because 100% of the qualified and recognized scholars have sat in judgment against it and given their qualified opinions in favor of Satan. This is exactly what they do. If 100% of the good, godly, dedicated fundamentalists don't like, like the AV text, they can go sit on attack. Amen. So, um, let me stick this thing back here where it usually sits. Um, if you have more questions about these contradictions and things, get the book. Um, you know, to me, I look at it and I just say, uh, it's God's word. It's not going to contradict. I know it's not going to contradict. Well, why is he 22? It's one says 22. Why is it 42? Well, there's a lot of logical explanations you come up with. I mean, you can, if you want the full description and the full, how everything works out, get the book. Uh, if you just want to be a Bible believing Christian and you know, you don't need all that, that's fine if you're into that stuff. But if you just want to be a Bible-believing Christian, you just say, well, 
you know. Um, could be that he was named king when he was 22, but didn't actually get to sit down on the throne until he was 42. Or it could be that there were two different kingdoms there, Judah and Israel. Uh, works out. Not a big deal. You know? So that's how I would answer that question. Um, just believe the book, people. And, and you get these people and they, they say, uh, you know, well, there's obviously a contradiction, so I have to reject the whole book. You know, it's just amazing to me. Um, the Word of God is likened to a double-edged sword in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It's quick, it's powerful, sharper than sharper than, than any two-edged sword. And, you know, you think about that, you think of a, a double-edged sword, and you think, wow, it can cut both ways and things. And uh, that's really the point. You see, the Bible, it does cut both ways. To the saved, this book will lead you into the truth. The Holy Spirit will come down, and He will guide you into all truth. And you'll look at this book, and you'll go, wow, you know, let me show you a verse of scripture to kind of back up what I'm saying here. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, really important verse. First Thessalonians 2, verse 13 says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. This book doesn't work for you. Revelation stops when you stop believing it. If you want God to open up the pages of this book, then you open it and you say, this is God's book. Thank you, Lord, for this word. And you will be shocked at what the Lord will reveal from this book. Not the ones that come from the Vatican, like the NIV, NASV, ESV, all the other stupid ones. New King James mixes, tries to mix this and the Roman Catholic readings and stuff. It's junk. Throw it out with all the others. You'll be amazed at how great this book is. Very much amazed. And you're not going to see contradictions in it. You're going to go, wow, this is amazing. You see? But if people approach this book with a skeptical eye, that sword will say, okay, I can lead you into the truth, and I can also lead you into error. And you get people saying, I won't believe in Jesus Christ. I won't believe in eternity and heaven and things like that. Why? Because one verse says 22 years old and the other says 42 years old. <laughs> Stupid. You're an imbecile. Ignorant. Moron. Whatever you want to say. <laughs> Ridiculous. You reject the God that created the universe, wrote about it in a book, and you reject all of that because one verse says 22 years old, the other says 42 years old. And there's ways to explain it. It's crazy. You say, well, I know this guy, he says he's a Christian, but he doesn't use the King James because of that contradiction, that supposed contradiction. And there's a few others, you know, you'll get, uh, it says Easter when it should be Passover. So you throw the whole book out because of that? And you actually do the study and you realize, oh, actually, it can't be Passover because it's, uh, you know, after the days of unleavened bread. Can't be the Passover when Herod intends to bring Peter forth. And Herod is not a Jew. He's a pagan, which is why he would be celebrating Easter, the ancient pagan festival of, I think it's a Starte or Ishtar or something. Like, different names from different cultures. But they reject the whole book based on something that some scholar has told them. And again, you know, why do people bring these things up to Bible believers? They're trying to shake your faith in the book. You know, you say, well, how do I describe this stuff to them? You say, it's not a contradiction. Okay, if you want the whole scholarly thing, get Ruckman's book. But I can look at that and I can say, well, couldn't it be that he just was 22 and he was given the title king, but he didn't actually sit on the throne until 42? Could it be that he had one kingdom there when he was 22 and ruled and reigning in that kingdom and 42 when he got another one? Like King James? Don't let people shake your faith in the book, brethren. So, like I said, if you have other questions, I think there's another one out there too, uh, another book on the supposed contradictions. Uh, I'm not seeing it right now. There is a, There are a couple books on these supposed contradictions in the Word of God. Um, 
you know, and another thing that you're going to have to watch out for, they'll say the Greek actually reads something or other, and what they won't tell you is that there are two different Greek texts, Nestles and the Texas Receptus. And they say, yes, but I found a place where the King James Bible does not even follow the Texas Receptus. Uh, yeah, because they would oftentimes use older translations than even some of the Greek manuscripts that underlied this. See? The King James Bible was the greatest translation ever in history. You say, how do you know that? By the fruit it produced. You'll never find a Bible that can produce the kind of fruit that the King James Bible produced. Never. Not going to happen. So, I mean, I can keep this thing going and going and going. I could show you so many of these new versions. I have a collection of them. I could show you so many of them that have come and gone and come and gone and come and gone. The New American Standard Version is actually the old American Standard Version, which came basically from the one from England, the revised version. Try to find a revised version sometime in a bookstore. Walk and say, I'd like to have an 1884, 1885 uh, the whole thing, 1881 is when the New Testament came out. Did you have an 1881 revised version New Testament? <laughs> no, they don't have it. They redo it and they redo it redo it. You go into the Bible store and you say, I'd like to have a King James Bible New Testament. It's there. I know some of you say, you know, it's a lot of these Christian bookstores, they don't have them. Um, I'm very thankful to be in America where we can get a huge variety of King James Bibles. And, uh, so, anyhow, there are no contradictions in the King James Bible. Uh, just read it and believe it, brethren. If you want to know more about the history of the King James Bible, you can check out my documentary for free. It won't cost you a cent. Just a little bit of your time. Uh, the Real Bible Version Issue Exposed. I have it in different parts on this channel, my other channel. Uh, it's on there, the full thing, in high definition, the whole deal. Um, Check it out. It's important that you have God's Word, not the other ones. Thank you for watching.